All right, so now let's start. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Research Days event. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today, we'll talk about a new type of DDoS attacks and EDOS attacks on cloud infrastructure. Uh, we'll discuss what they are, why they are so important, what kind of damage can they do to our infrastructure, how can one perform them, and most importantly, how we can possibly prevent them or at least detect them. With me here are our speakers for today, Professor Anat Bremler uh, from Tel Aviv University, Israel, and Michael uh, uh, Chaisler uh, from uh, Eichmann University, also in Israel. Also with me here is uh, Jeremy Eder, uh, a distinguished engineer from Red Hat who will lead this conversation. And with that, uh, Jeremy, uh, Michael and Anat, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much. So welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, this is, a, is an exciting topic. I, uh, my, my current role at Red Hat, my name is Jeremy Eder. As I said, I'm one of the DEs that's um, working in Red Hat's growing managed services business. And so these topics are, are front and center for us, reliability topics. I like to say stable, secure, performant, and boring is what our platform services need to provide for customer, um, for customer value. So I've been here about four years in this particular group, Red Hat overall, for quite a bit longer. Um, so four years here, and um, this this research is um, I'm excited to, for the have the folks here to share it with you, um, and hopefully we can figure out how to apply it to our day to day. Um, so over to you, Michael. Um, so my name is Michael. Uh, I'm a, a, a master student at the, at the Reichman University. I recently graduated. Um, uh, today I'll present part of my my research focused on on, on cloud and and uh, uh, services and infrastructure and DDoS attacks. Um, my day job is not uh, is not uh, academic. I'm a group lead at, uh, at Mobileye. It's a big uh, company in the automotive sector, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Jeremy. Not to you. Hi. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I'm Anat. I'm professor at Tel Aviv University. Just moved from Reichman University, and I think I will start. I will. Okay, and we love to hear your feedback. So ask ask question. Give us feedback. So we will talk about cloud audio scaling mechanism under DDoS attack. I will speak about Yoyo attack. Michael will speak about tandem attack. And a little bit headlines about Yoyo from the internet, Yoyo DDoS cyber attacks, what they are and how they can beat them. A Yoyo attack from security company, hardware information, replays, how to defeat them. And if you look at Wikipedia, you will see also in DDoS uh, the Yoyo attack definition. And Yoyo attack is a name we coined in a paper um, seven years ago. We predicted that there will be DDoS attack uh, on the auto scanning mechanism uh, in the cloud. And from that time, we did a lot of research with the new uh, technology, Kubernetes, microservices, Michael uh, my, uh, will talk about it. So the agenda, we will talk about DDoS pre-cloud, okay? And then we will talk about uh, in the cloud, DDoS attack. And then I will present Yoyo attacks. I will start with VMs. As I told you, the first paper was seven years ago, so VM, and then uh, how it, look on Kubernetes, and then how you can detect and mitigate them. And then uh, Michael will talk about the tandem effect, uh, what happened with microservice auto scaling mechanism, and how attacker can exploit it to launch tandem attack. We will talk a lot, bit a lot about uh, leech attack. And I will start. So pre-cloud DDoS attack, okay? This talk is focused on application level DDoS. And DDoS at application level create an overload of the request. You have servers, hardware servers, that's know to handle the, your capacity. And when the bad guys come, 
the good guys suffer from performance degradation and performance uh, damage. Why do we have DDoS attack? So, uh, uh, first, 20 years ago, you see this guy, this is the mafia boy. When he was a teenager, he launched the first big successful DDoS attacks on Amazon, uh, Yahoo, CNN. And basically, it was personal enjoyment, intellectual challenge. He felt like he's on control. And uh, on a personal note, after this attack, I co-founded a company that mitigated uh, DDoS attack. It's called River Networks. In 2004, uh, the company was acquired by Cisco. And from that time, I do a lot of research of different aspects uh, of DDoS. So what happened with the time? And with the time, uh, the motivation is different. Motivation now is financial gain, extortion, blackmail. The attacker say to the victim, pay us in bitcoins or we launch an attack. And also business warfare, like the attacker want to run the competitors out of business. And there's also other motivation, less common in the enterprise, political activism and cyber warfare between uh, countries. So now we're in the area of cloud and how uh, DDoS attacks look on the cloud. So basically the cloud has a lot of, uh, give a lot of promise because it outsources, outsources many of the maintenance and infrastructure spend. And one of the big promises is the auto scaling, the ability to add machine to cope with overload. And as you see here, you have a different fluctuation on overall, overload over the day. And then you can buy virtual machine as required in the morning less, in the afternoon more. And now I need a little bit of details. That means usually defined auto scaling rules by metrics of threshold duration to track, which is called the scale intervals. And if VM CPU is utilization above some percent, 80% in my example for two minutes, the two minutes is important for me, then perform a scale up, add machine. This is the mechanism of, of auto scaling. And auto scaling appears as one of the best practice for DDoS resilience in AWS. And why is that? Because you have now VM, not uh, hardware servers, and now come the bad guys with overload, botnet, many requests. Uh, and then there is auto scaling. New VMs are added. Okay. N more capacity. Now the cloud customers suffer only from economic damage. Okay, no performance damage. And it's called in the literature EDOS, economic denial of sustainability attack or denial of wallets. So if we want to understand the difference between the performance damage and economic damage, because it is important to my talk, first you need to notice that uh, in the enterprise, the damage is uh, uh, the department but deal with it are differently because performance damage is DevOps and economic damage is final ops if they, if they are exist. From the publicity of the attack, performance damage it's bad PR because everybody understands something happened. You have denial of service, you have failure, you have service degradation, high latency, and economic damage is, can go under the radar in uh, the perspective of the uh, uh, press. And because of that, we don't have a good statistics how uh, many attacks uh, of DDoS cause economic damage, okay? From the damage perspective, performance damage is also uh, translate to revenue loss, but you have also reputation damage and in economic damage, you have direct expense of the damage itself. So 
what is the outcome from this? Uh, you need a uh, finance observability. Why? Because cloud, pro cloud provides information at the level of the cloud service. You can know how many resources of EC2 uh, you use. And in some cases also in delay, not in real time. But from the cloud customer, he need to map it to the application level to understand which part in application level is now under the attack. And this is uh, his responsibility to translate it to the application level. So we have a challenge of finance observability. So in the big picture about cloud and DDoS is that cloud mitigate network level DDoS, which is not the focus of this talk. Cloud help because it, we have large pipes, we have anti spoofing mechanism built in, in the load balancer, we have CDN, but here we focus on the application. When the attacker sends a lot of requests to the API, to the search pages, to the login pages, and so on. And uh, to cope with this attack is the responsibility of the cloud customer and not the cloud provider because it doesn't have visibility to the application. And, uh, um, and the remedy of large patch and uh, of the cloud and CDN ca uh, cannot help. So what is yo-yo attack, okay? Uh, yo-yo attack is the attack that caused both economic and performance damage, okay? So the idea is that attacker can exploit the auto-scaling mechanism. In yo-yo attack, the attacker sent special crafted wave of DDoS, and I will explain later that it's very common to attack by uh, waves of DDoS. You have this scenario, and now I will zoom in what happened. You have the good guys, and then the bad guys came. But now I will focus what happens. Until there is scaling up, okay, and it takes time. Remember the two minutes uh, scale up interval, okay? And there is also more time it, it, it causes because until there is a scaling up, because you need to scale the machine, but also the software, okay? Until uh, you have a new VM running and ready, the good guys suffer from performance damage. Then the scaling occur. But then our sophisticated attacker in Yoda stop sending traffic. Now you uh, the, the victim has a cost economic damage of uh, buying the extra VM, but there is no overload. Okay, no overload. And then what happened in auto scaling? There will be scale down. Okay, but again, it will take time. In all that time, you will have economic damage. And what you can see that we have here economic damage and performance damage, and all this situation is harder to de detect. And from the attacker perspective, it's very efficient. It requires few resources from the attacker because it's not active all the time, okay? So again, you will do burst of traffic. The good guys will suffer uh, 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 performance damage and it take, will take time, few minutes. Few minutes is enough for the damage. And again, he will stop sending the attack and uh, we will continue with this uh, wave of traffic. Now you can understand why we point in a yo-yo attack because you have scaling up, scaling down, scaling up, scaling down. This is how uh, we decided about this name. Yeah, I think one of the one of the interesting things about this is how disproportionate the effort is versus the damage that could be caused, um, particularly in if your system is somehow understandable by the attacker to the point where they could find the most the weakest point or the most effective you know thing to to um attack 
Uh, that's that's the, the interesting part of all of what you've said so far to me is like it doesn't take a lot. It's not expensive, and it and it represents a huge amount of risk. So some of the we, we put to, we put a couple of polls up. Anad and Michael, um, I'm not sure if you've seen them yet. The first one was, "Have you been a victim of a DDoS attack?" Um, and it's split 50 50 right now. Yes and no. For those folks may may not have even you know. I, I guess it's theoretically possible that uh, you have been a victim and haven't. It wasn't big enough to detect, um, or you have a CDN that provides that you know cover for you as an example. Any thoughts on the first uh, that first set of data? Otherwise, there's a second poll as well. Uh, CDN wouldn't help in the application level attack, so uh, it helps in uh, if it's not on the application. If it's on statics data, and uh, YoYo is applicable to uh, application level attack. This is the focus of the. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is it? Uh, okay. The second uh, poll is about um, about YoYo attacks as you were defining them. We asked the audience whether. Uh, whether they think that their current observability system would be able to detect this type of attack and then leaving the mitigation as a separate question, you know, could, would you even be able to see it? Oh, and very it's about, uh, about three to two, uh, no to yes. Wow. Interesting. Wow. I would love to hear, uh, how you, you observe the attack, it's very interesting. It's not so obvious. There are a couple of people that said yes. I voted in the poll and said probably not um, on <laughs> our end, uh, or at least not until it was well big. underway. You know? Yeah, big. Yeah. Uh, Michael will show later that there is a, a, a trend of attack, which is called leech attack, when they... Uh, try to to send bursts that will be under the radar but will still cause economic damage so yeah it's in, it, it is interesting so for folks that voted yes on that second question about observability if you if you're willing to share any information maybe put it in the chat and say hey this is how we think we would have caught this scenario that, that might benefit the rest of the audience too otherwise i'm not if you want to um, keep going please uh, thank you. So uh, I think uh, something we need to discuss is, is it fe feasible to do burst of attack of few minutes on, off, on, off? And the answer that it's very common. By the way, when we wrote the paper, it wasn't common, okay? So the attacker become more powerful and they know to synchronize the attacks. And today, 50% of the attacks our wave of attack, it's called wave of the attack, pulsed attack, burst attack. This is a real attack that, that's a capture from Imperva. You see here the peaks, the peaks of a few minutes and then a stop. And a burst attack came to the world for confusing the DDoS carbon mechanism. Okay? Not the, when we talk about yo yo, the goal here is to confuse the auto scaling mechanism. Burst attack and wave of attack come after the attacker notice they can confuse the scrubbing mechanism, as you can see from uh, uh, this headline uh, in the internet from uh, Imperva. And this pattern is very common today for different reasons. Okay, but in yo yo attack, we focus on uh, the damage it caused to the auto scaling mechanism. So uh, I will give a little bit of more details. And uh, Jeremy, you talk about the fact uh, uh, how you can build the most effective DDoS attack. It's very interesting problem. We try in our paper uh, uh, to find the optimal, OK? And uh, for that, we need to understand the power behind the, the details behind your, your attack. So, why it takes time for the scaling to kick in? So there is two, uh, two intervals that are important. First is the scale interval. 
which is configured by the admin. Okay, so because you said if the threshold of the metric exceeds for duration of some minutes, then we'll, we'll do the scaling. So this is the, the first few minutes. And the second parameter is the warning time of the machine. This, is the, uh, this parameter is given by the system infrastructure. If you do one time of scale up, you need the machine to run with the relevant software and state, it takes time. If you want to do scale down, again, you need to do book, a, a backup to move states, it takes time. So in VM world, it takes a few minutes until the scaling is kicking in. And our attacker exploit it. Uh, we have on attack, off attack, on attack, it send burst of traffic until the scaling up occurs, few minutes. Then he decided to do off attack, stop sending the attack traffic, wait until the scale down occurs, and he do it repeatedly after he, he see that the scale down has occurred and ended. So uh, how can he detect the parameter to be optimal? So in, in Yoyo attack, the attacker can know how to oscillate it because he can send probe requests and check the response time, okay? So all of time, there is some threshold of peacetime round trip time, okay? Failures is huge uh, RTT in, uh, in our case. And if you are above the threshold when the attacker send the traffic, you know the scale-up process is not ended because if it ended, the round trip time will be regular, okay? So he can feel the state of the, of the cloud and when the attacker, attacker can optimize the attack by feeling the state. So we took a use case example and analyzed it in the paper and then we will show real experiment toy example on AWS and it's a, it's a little bit uh, uh, details, but bear with me. Here you have the economic damage. It measured by the number of machine. Okay, here you have the economic damage measured by the number of machine. And in the up, and in the down, you have performance damage measured by machine load. And this is the use case examples. And uh, the blue area, is the regular traffic. So in regular traffic, you have 1,000 requests per minute, and you have 10 machines, and then we have an attack with peak extra load of factor of two. So now you have 3,000 requests per machine, and you can see that we have performance damage. Until when? until the scaling is uh, up is kicking in so it will take scale up interval until the machine will be up and then it will take more time until the warming scale up will finish all from this after the scale up interval you pay for the machine only when the warming scale up is ended you have you finish with the performance damage and then uh, the white area is where the attacker stops sending the attack and uh, you still pay for the machine because it takes time to, to do scale down because the scale down in interval because the worm is scaled down and then again he uh, do an on attack and started the attack again so a question for you or not Mm -hmm. um, maybe the audience is sharing some of this question too, but it seems like in this attack, the attacker is trying to optimize for the number of scale up cycles, the more, the better. So if, if you can only trigger a scale up after a scale down, how do the, how can we know when a scale down event has completed if they don't have access to the internal systems, how can they empirically from the outside detect that a scale down is done so that they can start the next um, phase? So I, I think it, 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 you need a little bit of trial of error because if the scale down uh, didn't end and the attacker will send a huge burst, 
the huge burst will be answered with no uh, increasing in the round trip time and latency, okay? And by the way, to guess the scale up interval and the warming and the scale up and scale down interval and the warming time, you can guess it because uh, usually there is a default of the scale up and scale down interval, which is one or two minutes. And the warming time of a machine is uh, nowadays uh, basically two or three minutes, but it can try an arrow and fill uh, the, the, the infrastructure by sending from time to time a, a burst of traffic and see the round trip time. Okay. The, this, uh, you know, in, in papers, we like to say that we can be optimal, but even if you're not uh, uh, the most optimal, this uh, attack is, is cause more damage uh, than a flat DDoS attack in the cloud. So to emphasize it, I want to compare it, okay? So if you have a pre-cloud DDoS, the attacker is 100% active and the performance, you have only performance damage. If the, you have extra peak load of a uh, factor of two, the performance damage is that you have extra load on every machine of factor of two and this translates to uh, errors and longer RTP. If you are in the cloud and you do flat DDoS, you're 100% active, you don't have performance damage, but economic damage is uh, by factor of two. But if you're in yo-yo attack, you can be half the time active, but the extra average load with by, by factor of one and the economic cost will be by factor of 116. And if you look from the attacker perspective, is more cost effective. He use less resource and perform a, a huge damage, which is all performance, performance damage and economic damage. And when he start to attack one victim, he can go to attack another victim, okay? And, and they do it, okay? In burst and push attacks, they do it. So uh, th this is the, the comparison, but we can show it on, uh, uh, on real uh, case on AWS. Of course, the toy example. Now the performance damage is measured by response time and the error. The error is in red. The response time is in blue. And you can see the economic damage of increase. By the way, we use adaptive out of scaling, adapted out of scaling. It means that the out of scaling know how many machine to add, okay? Uh, in order to cope with the load. So we add them automatically all of them at once. And as you can see, uh, you have performance damage and economic damage, okay? The, the victim suffer from errors, he suffer from very long response time, uh, and this is on AWS. Question before I'm moving to Kubernetes? So, I don't see any in the chat. Um, okay. Oh, wait, hold on. Is there a signature to definitely distinguish burst attack from legitimate burst activity in user workload? Wow, great question. You know, for that, you need data. And I, I'm not sure I know how to answer it without seeing uh, real data. Uh, I will talk later on about detecting yo-yo attack on Kubernetes, and on toy example, we could distinguish it. We did some noise of regular data, but yes, you know, to know it for real, you need real uh, data. Uh, I think, but most of, you know, most of the, the traffic to, to the cloud is not bursty in such huge manner as in yo-yo attack. So this what this is uh, my sense on the question. Yeah, I think there's there's two things. One, one is I used to do business with uh, um, 
perfume and fragrance website and they were around Valentine's Day, around Mother's Day, around uh, the, they were, it, that was a, the, as bursty as it gets. Um, one thing I wanted to share internally here is uh, this, um, how, uh, about a signature on how to detect it. Well, you know, there's one, one sort of real world example, this wasn't production facing, thankfully, internally only, but uh, we managed to DDoS ourselves internally. Um, by misconfiguring a client, a couple of clients. And the way we detected that was the service account that those clients were using to authorize suddenly had massive um, increase in authentication requests. So we were able to identify which client was causing the problem that way. And that was a very workload specific. So if your question is whether there's a generic signature, I would say likely not, unless you can tie it back to a specific kind of client in other words if it's a client server application um you know you might be able to find it that way generically but that's a real world thing happens to us and uh it's you know since then we've actually that that caused us to um increase the urgency of our, our of some development work we had been kind of deferring for uh for auto scaling along different metrics along different vectors, um, auto scaling mechanisms that are in open source are fairly, uh, simple. And sometimes the business logic and sometimes it's not enough for uh, the particular scenario. So for example, a workload could, could cause, uh, degradation and it not be CPU or memory intensive. It could be storage or network intense and, um, sure. never auto scaler. So that's another angle here is like, it really depends on, on the type of workload, how you configure your auto scaler. That's a, that's a real world, you know, example of what's, what we've done internally. It, it, yes. Uh, to answer, I think, you know, flash cow that happen, uh, usually are not very bursty because uh, the success of some campaign and it, it's occurred, but it's not very bursty. Uh, Michael will discuss long about uh, uh, tandem attack of auto scaling mechanism and self inflicted uh, DDoS. Extraction a signature uh, on the fly of stream data. I had work about it. I will mention a little bit about this. Uh, sometimes there is a signature. Okay, you, if you detect you under attack, you can see that the uh, uh, traffic. Now is different and there is some repeated signature that doesn't appear in regular traffic. But this, uh, uh, you need for this peacetime and attack traffic uh, samples in order uh, to retrieve the signature. So I, I will go quickly on Kubernetes because I want to give uh, time to Ma Michael to, to uh, present the tandem attack. So, what happened in Kubernetes, okay? So in Kubernetes, we know you have Node, Node is VM, uh, Pod is the basic compute unit, and uh, it's basically a container, several containers, several pods running a single node, and you have auto scanning of pods and nodes. And that we configured auto scanning rules, they look very similar, you have many auto scaling, uh, you know, algorithms. We choose the uh, uh, scaling or horizontal auto scaling, where the when you decide to scale, uh, you decide uh, to scale the pods. You calculate the desired number of pods. Uh, it, it's calculated according to some metrica. For example, you have target utilization. And then you have a formula, to, uh, how many nodes you need to achieve this target utilization. And uh, you scale the pods, but uh, usually there is a room in the nodes to scale more pods, but uh, in, if, there, if you need much more nodes, you need to scale the nodes to fit the, the, the target number of pods. So in this example, here you again the bad guys, they come, uh, you can scale a little bit the pods, the overload is a little bit reduced, but you will need to scale more nodes. 
And what is important to notice is that spots have a, have a short scale up and scale down time. Nodes have long scale up and scale down time. And uh, now when you scale more nodes, usually the cost model is according to the number of nodes. Usually you configure it with spare capacity of scaling pods in the existing node. A scaling pod in existing nodes, there almost no performance damage. There's no economic damage, but eventually if the attack is high, you need to scale nodes. And when you scale a node, you have performance damage, and again, you have economic damage. So again, you can do the yo-yo attack. So now you send burst of traffic, uh, the auto scaling increase the number of pods, and then increase the number of nodes to feed the required pods. And then again, the attacker decided to do off attack, and uh, then you wait to scale down. We check it on Kubernetes, on the example, of course. We need higher load because usually 20% uh, uh, by factor 20%, because usually in Kubernetes there are free uh, resource for extra pods. And what you, you can see here in the yellow is the increase in number of pods when you are on attack, and then the slow increase in the number of nodes, and also in the scale down, the scale down of nodes take longer time, and you pay according to the nodes. So this is an important factor. And here you see the CPU utilization and the response time uh, and errors. And you can see that under attack, the CPU utilization increase is above uh, 100 because they calculated all the sum of the utilization of the, of the pods in the same node. This is how they calculated it. And you can see the effect of YoYo. And if you are going back and trying to compare what happens in YoYo attack on Kubernetes, if you compare it against flat DDoS attack in Kubernetes, uh, the attacker can be active only a third of the time and the economic damage is uh, almost the same. And in a yo-yo attack, you have also performance damage. If you want to compare yo-yo attack on Kubernetes and yo-yo attack on VM, it's hard to compare, but we tried. Basic stuff we saw that you have more, econo more performance damage when you are on VM because in Kubernetes, the, the fast scaling up of the pods reduces a little bit the performance damage, okay? So this is in interesting. It, uh, the measurement was on uh, GCP. And I'm now going to talk about how to detect and mitigate your attack. Is there any question? So we don't have a question, but there was one other poll that was run. Um, and it was... Uh, and I know we need to get to Michael by by around the 45 minute mark here. Um, the cloud provides the illusion of infinite resources. Companies don't have infinite budget. How do you balance cloud spend while meeting performance and scalability needs? Uh, wow. so this, yeah, well, the, so the, the, it's, a, it's a really important question because we're, you know, customer uh, acquisition cost is a very key indicator for, for the business. It takes money to attract customers and there's only so much money to go around to attract people. And if the performance isn't what it needs to be, those those customers, which you just paid to try and attract, they, they either don't try or they don't come back. So that's where the performance kind of side comes in here. Now, the answers to that question, there's not too many votes, but um, the, leading, the leading choice here is cloud provider billing alerts. Um, a couple of people, okay, so there's more votes trickling in now. Uh, a couple of people saying that they're, they have a FinOps team that will provide reports. Um, these are reactive, right? Both of those are reactive. Uh, and then there's a, a couple of folks indicating they don't have a policy in place here. So no proactive uh, choice was there. Uh, there's also other was an option um, that nobody's taken yet. So not a lot proactive there. Um, it'd be interesting to know 
you know, your thoughts on those answers, Anat or Michael? Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's connected to this, this slide. It, it's, you need to balance performance and cost. It's the question. Um, I think, uh, and every company, I think the balance is a little bit different. So uh, I wanted to talk about remedy. If you want to remedy without getting a new solution, a new DDoS cover to the table, the main question for the customer, what is more important? If it's the performance, so you need to leave reserve pool, you need to do scale up earlier, scale down slowly. But if it's cost, you will do more resource limitation, but then the problem in performance under attack, and then you will lose revenue because loss of in performance, yes, I totally agree, it's loss of revenue, and it's a question. But basically, I think what I wanted to say that auto scaling is not remedy of application DDoS because it's basic clown to address peak hours problem. And if you want to really mitigate DDoS, you need DDoS scrubbers. And I will show next the POC of machine learning detection of YoYo. And then if you detect that you are under yo-yo, you can find the tax signature if it exists, okay? This is a, a work we done on zero day signature extraction for high volume attacks on real time. And then mitigated the attack, but it's a hard question. It's not so, there is no easy solution. Michael, do you have some thought about the subject? <coughs> So I know what I'm gonna say is not 100% deterministic, but we did we did uh, uh, met uh, quite a lot of companies the past few months uh, uh, around uh, this this topic, and you, you could uh, divide them into two two groups. Usually the startups, though, with the limited budget, would say, yeah, we we prefer to to pay a penalty in performance, even though they're like heavy on, on acquiring new users or or building their business, uh, but they will. Uh, uh, run out of funds much quicker uh, while the larger companies would usually have more spare capacity or planning uh, I, I know it's it's not every company uh, uh, the the reserves to have some some interruptions or have a finops team that calculates cloud budgets to have some uh, uh, something that could uh, could allow handling such an event um, but again, there is no right and wrong here. That, that's what we, we saw in, in a lot of companies we've met over the past few months. Um, and again, the, the, the solution is, is not within, within the scaling mechanism. The solution is, and, and, and there is a huge gap there uh, with, with scrubbers to handle uh, uh, applicative uh, uh, attacks. Uh, in yeah. the net world, there are probably solutions for the, the, the last two decades. Uh, uh, in the application, there's still a gap. Capture has been hacked. Uh, authentication uh, uh, is, is very limited. Uh, and in some cases where companies have, let's say, a search page, a, a login form, some, some open form for details, these will never have authentication on top of them, or mostly. Uh, and so th there will always be some, some narrow gaps that the attackers can, uh, can uh, uh, try to get into. Yes. So I, I have uh, two more slides, and Michael will talk about tandem attack. So. We do did a proof of concept how to detect your, your attacks. Basically, the idea that you will do traffic machine learning, uh, you have sample of normal traffic and attack traffic, and uh, when you receive traffic, you want to classify it. And the idea is that we take features like response time, use CPU utilization, number of pod, number of node, maximum, minimum, uh, you know, me and all uh, the others take it as a time series and give it to the Ichibus. Ichibus is a, a decision tree model and you need to, to classify it if it's yo yo or regular traffic. And you know, the results uh, are great, but it's a toy example. Uh, it's a, it, it, that show a proof of concept. We try other uh, machine learning models. 
Uh, Ixibus was the best, the train it time was the small, it was the most uh, accurate uh, uh, solution. So uh, I think there is a need of a specific solution and uh, Michael will talk about, about uh, tandem and tandem effect. Michael, I will do right, stop so, sharing. Yeah, Jeremy, so is strange. there more question or feedback? I don't see any other, oh, there's a question here. Did you consider that the base cost of Kubernetes could be higher compared to VMs because we have to keep free resources to have space for pods to scale out? Yes. Uh, I think the model, you know, we did a toy example. Uh, I totally agree that there is also overhead in Kubernetes comparing to the VM. Uh, I'm not sure the toy example captured this aspect, but it's an interesting aspect. Okay, before we move on to Michael, there is one other question here from Jonathan. Could randomization of the on-off periods impact the ability of the training set to distinguish between attacks and legitimate traffic? Great question. This is, was, was also my question to the, the student that did the, the work on machine learning and detecting the yo-yo attack on Kubernetes. I believe randomization will make it harder. Because of that, I said, this is a you know, proof of concept. Uh, we need to understand more uh, how effective is machine learning against randomization. Uh, I think it will be effective, but less. Okay, great. All right, on to the next subject, I believe. Great. Connected um, subject. All right, so um, as mentioned, my name is Michael. I'm, I'm from uh, Reichman University in Israel. Uh, again, thank you for ha having us here at the uh, Reddit Research Talks. Uh, my re research area is DDoS attacks on, on cloud services and infrastructure. And today I'll present a part of it that's focused on, on DDoS attack exploiting the, uh, the microservice architecture with different auto-scaling properties. So I have you on, on, a, on a side screen, so feel free to pop questions in the chat and, and make it as interactive as much as possible. And also at the end, we'll have our uh, uh, email contacts and feel free to contact via email or LinkedIn uh, uh, if you wish to follow up on the topic. All right. <clears throat> so uh, uh, let, let's have a little bit background about microservices. Uh, for those who are not familiar, generally speaking, when developing software under this, this paradigm, we usually break our system. It was before a monolith into a relatively small, loosely coupled applications that communicate using API and standard protocols. It could also be asynchronous communication using some messaging queue. And those small applications are what we usually refer to as, as microservices. And a system grow and evolve with more services added to handle new features, new business logic. The connectivity and the call graph between those services can become quite complex. Uh, just to give the notion of how complex it can be, I've added this completely unreadable example from uh, Wix uh, uh, production cluster from, I think, last year. Um, and, and you can see the level of complexity uh, uh, in, in this uh, scenario. And usually with microservices, we'll have different uh, scaling properties. It could be either as a result of, of configuration by DevOps, by system administrators, or derived from the type of service. I'll explain a little bit more about uh, in the next few slides. Um, our research uh, will be presented at the upcoming uh, IEEE Infocom in, uh, in New York in May, uh, and it will focus on, on uh, uh, exploiting those different scaling properties to create both uh, performance and economic DDoS. <clears throat> so let's start with a, a very naive example. Uh, let's take this uh, family tandem bicycle. Uh, we have the dad that can pedal relatively fast, 20 kilometers per hour. The mom can also pedal uh, relatively fast, but the children uh, can pedal only, only five kilometers per hour, but they determine the speed uh, uh, for everyone. And the same goes with microservices uh, uh, scaling. And the chain of services that's involved in handling a request is limited by the services that are scaling more slowly. And that is what we call the, the tandem effect of, of microservices. 
and as I mentioned before, the, the limitation when scaling could be a, a result of a, a declared configuration, but can also be due to something native to the service operation. If you look at the, the call graph on the, on the left side of the, of the slide, we can see a stateless uh, web service performing a call to a database, which in many cases is slower uh, when scaling up since it needs to handle operations also on the data and not only, only on the compute. Um, in, in almost most of the next slides, I'm going to use cybersecurity terminology, talk about attack, but uh, and analyze uh, according to it. Uh, uh, but the tandem behavior can also cre be created by uh, 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 by con faulty configurations of system administrators, and that's what we usually call the, as you mentioned before, Jeremy, the self-inflicted EDOS. And, and everyone that managed large large production system uh, uh, have been in this situation at least once. So let's dive into how to exploit this behavior to launch a, a DDoS attack. Um, so the example uh, and the experiment I'll show here were conducting on an, uh, an AWS serverless stack, uh, uh, but the same problem applies also on other microservices implementation, also on Kubernetes. Uh, we chose to showcase on serverless infrastructure, uh, also to disrupt the, the concept that serverless takes away from the developer or the DevOps, the need of maintenance or the need to manage the infrastructure and, and sometimes even introduce new, new complex challenges. <clears throat> so our experiment were conducted on a, on a very basic architecture, but, but very popular, uh, consisting of AWS Lambda functions triggered by incoming HTTP requests where each Lambda is writing to, to DynamoDB. I've dropped from the slides, uh, 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 but there's also an API gateway uh, uh, between the incoming traffic uh, uh, that's the, passing the traffic and triggering the Lambda. I'll give a, bit, a few words about each of the services, and but try to wrap it up uh, 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 with only what's needed for the next slide. So Lambda is a serverless service that allow execution of code functions, usually triggered by, by some event, and we have to often refer them as function as a service. It's a very popular way to build applications these days. Um, the cost of executing a Lambda function is derived mostly from its execution time and from the resources allocated to run the code, even though we don't actually see them. They're not visible to us. Uh, the Lambda has no upper bound for capacity limits. AWS uh, uh, can, can handle any, any number of Lambda you use to, to execute. Um, but you as a system administrator can limit the number of executed lambdas in parallel. So you do have some control. Uh, and they're rel relatively fast to scale. Behind the scenes, we're talking about containers. They, they, they uh, provision the container. When it's finished, the, the code execution, it evaporates uh, uh, and, and done. Uh, DynamoDB is a, is a serverless key value database, which has two main modes of operation. Uh, one is on demand, which I, I won't uh, uh, present in the experiments today, but we did include them in the research because it showcased something else. Um, where the DB doesn't have any pre-configured limitation and over the time, uh, and it does it quite well, uh, it, it's able to adapt to any incoming load. Uh, today I'll focus uh, more on the, the provision mode, which has an upper and lower limits on the number of requests it can serve. And within that limit, the, the database is trying to maintain some utilization ratio that the user user defines. Uh, so it implements some reserve pool as part of the service. Uh, since it's a, a serverless database, the capacity is billing is mostly done on what AWS call capacity units, and they are defined by the size of the items we write or read from the database. In our experiments, we made sure that each Lambda execution is consuming exactly one of those capacity units. Uh, WC is a write capacity units from DynamoDB, which made the analysis much, much easier. In real production scenarios, obviously, the number is not fixed, and it's app-dependent, scenario-dependent, sometimes user-dependent. Um, and I know there's a lot of technical details here, but if you need to take one thing from this slide, is that the Lambda functions scale much faster than the database. Any questions to, to this point? Great. So uh, let me go on with the animation. Just explain it once. <clears throat> so the, the scenario. Of, um, a couple of data points. I just wanted to give you, Michael, while you were talking. Sure. Uh, there was a poll. Uh, there was a poll that asked whether your microservices, you, whether you used microservices at all, um, and it's four to one. Four to one, yes. So it looks like you're talking to the right the right audience. Um, um, and 
Yeah, there's a second poll running now, which talks about, you know, how, how common the specific technologies that you're about to talk about are amongst the audience. So we can circle back to that question once folks have had a chance to vote. Well, that'll be very interesting to hear. It's also, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, quite popular these days. Most, I think most of the new applications are developed in the microservice uh, manner. I think probably a lot of the monoliths in, in that were uh, running uh, uh, until a few years ago were, were uh, uh, repurposed to, to run as, as microservices. Uh, because of the advantages, less, uh, I'm talking about less about the technical side, more about the agile side of how do you develop software. And as a person that does did both uh, methods, I, I can vouch that it's a, 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 a way better uh, um, uh, implementation and how to develop and deliver uh, a software faster. Um, so coming back to our to our experiment, um, we have some friendly users like in the, the uh, Anats use case. Uh, th those are the blue uh, uh, blue blue guys, the benign traffic. And the attacker starts to overload the system with HTTP request. Each request is handled by a separate Lambda, a separate Lambda execution. And those scale up quite quickly. Uh, uh, well, DynamoDB can't. Uh, so it fails to match the scaling of, of, of the Lambda, and we have some drop traffic. Those Lambdas that failed to write to the database not only didn't serve their, their business purpose or the, the technical purpose, but were also paid in full. Uh, and that any part of the attack, the DB is serving also malicious traffic, which has an impact both on, on wasted expenditures and drop request of legitimate users. And again, it comes from the fact that we took those snapshots from the, the AWS UI. Uh, they have two completely different unsync separate scaling definitions. Um, so it's exactly like a, an unbalanced bicycle. You need both wheels to, to spin at the same rate. So what you see here is, is uh, actually a synthetic example to showcase the behavior. So in the blue, we, uh, we have the benign traffic uh, running at uh, 1,000 requests per second uh, with the database capacity set to handle between 500 and 1,500 uh, requests per second. And as the uh, attackers start the, the, uh, start the attack, the traffic spikes to uh, 3,000 uh, requests per second, and the DB scales to its uh, maximum capacity. Right. At this point, half of the, lamb the function functions are executed but fail to write to the DB. Um, and as we can see, the damage uh, aspect in, uh, uh, is in two, two areas, two fields. First, maybe the more trivial are the drop request. Uh, pretty much half of the requests are, are, not, uh, are not being served. Uh, the second one, the economic damage is due to, to two factors. The over-provisioned database, that's the red area in the, the upper chart. The second one is the lambdas that were executed but but uh, uh, didn't perform their goal, but were paid in full. Uh, that's the pinkish area. And I know I'm not running to, to one of the conclusions, but usually people ask at this point, but maybe you can perform some retry or some naive implementations. In that, in that case, actually, the lambda would be exponentially more expensive. Usually, if you implement some exponential back of retry, the lambda will cost exponentially more. And it has a, it had other, other side effects that I will uh, uh, discuss later. Um, so I'll get along with the with the slides. Yeah. So this while you're while you're um, getting that next slide ready, it looks like uh, these cloud services are very popular. <laughs> I don't know. If I probably could have predicted that. But the specific ones you're talking about, um, you know, the same ratio, four to one of folks that have adopted uh, the examples, RDS, Lambda, or DynamoDB. I think the the asymmetry of the different scaling mechanisms is, is the key thing that's really hard to wrestle with. I'm glad you're walking through this. Um, the, the underlying technology that makes scaling techniques different for a database versus for, you know, a compute bound workload or a, a memory heavy workload, you know, um, it's really an interesting problem to try and solve. So let's let's keep rolling here. All right, and again, I'll refer to something that Anat mentioned from the attacker's perspective. All you need to know is is uh, is the 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 response time or the round trip time of your request and the successful ratio. When I created the control plane that conducted these experiments, that's all I used. I used also some some matrix coming from the DDB, but that was only to smooth the, the charts. That's all an attacker need in order to to build a completely automated uh, attack control plane uh, that can can uh, uh, probe any any infrastructure. 
So th this is an actual uh, uh, real experiment that I did on the same same architecture. Uh, this involves both the, the tandem behavior between uh, the Lambda and, and DynamoDB and the YoYo attack pattern that I not uh, uh, presented. Um, besides the, the YoYo burst, uh, uh, the main difference from the, the previous synthetic example is that the attack uh, did not breach the upper uh, capacity limit. Uh, of the database, meaning it was aimed mostly at creating economic damage, and it will be be more uh, uh, more clear in the next slide. And what you can see is actually four waves of of yo-yo uh, uh, burst uh, bring the traffic closer to the upper capacity. That's like the the incoming request or the the black line, <clears throat> uh, uh, and the DB uh, scale up uh, uh, following uh, the increase in request. It could you can either refer to the green or the yellow line. They merge at some point. Uh, um, and when the attack stops, uh, we drop uh, we drop the traffic. Uh, the DB stays over provisioned. Uh, and actually, from minute uh, 110, you can see the over provisioning of the DB post uh, this uh, this burst much longer. And this is due to a, a limitation of DynamoDB in provision mode that that uh, limits the number of scale down operations it can perform per, per hour. Um, so after we did these four rounds of of yo-yo burst, the DB got pinned and at the uh, uh, at the maximum capacity, uh, and actually these these uh, red uh, vertical lines that you can see are actually failures of the database trying to descale itself, hitting its own limitation. And if the the experiments would have continued, you would see the next uh, 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 windows of of provisioning for the probably almost every uh, almost uh, 24 hours looked the same as the last one so actually the, the, the attack was more effective than we initially anticipated so here yeah, you can that's see really interesting i mean that, that that's kind of that's what i was asking earlier uh, or one of the polls was asking about if you can amortize the scale up scale down it looks like that's an example of it um it looks like eventually they just stop the autoscaler just stops acting, and that's based on the the, the, the previous cycle. So um, they're seeing a, a, a cyclical activity. In other words, they've detected something. Um, okay. However, they you know, yeah, and then but they stop. But it's only doing. the database. It's Say only it the database. It's hmm. only the database. The lambda scales. So I, I think it's the limitation of the database that the cloud wants uh, to protect itself and not mm -hmm. some uh, mechanism that detects the attack. What do you think, Michael? So yeah, it, it, is, it is showcasing a limitation specific to, to this database. The, the, the mechanism here is not necessarily about detecting or, or the limitation they have is not detecting those four waves as, as some, some malicious behavior. They could have spread them. We could have spread them differently over over the time. Uh, uh, the limit is there. Is there? I think per hour per day uh, that derive from that. So you could actually also from completely naive standard traffic that does some scale down from time to time because I know the marketing campaign is not working at the same uh, 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 ratio over the the day. Uh, you would still get stuck at some point, and it wouldn't scale down. I, I assume when they developed the database in this mode, uh, probably a long time ago, they assumed that once you you scaled up, you are more you are less likely to to scale down in a, in a short period of time. So I think it was developed as like an early protection mechanism. But again, this is not the the proper way to to handle it. The other other mode of the database called on demand that I didn't uh, uh, present it here is actually can accommodate any, any incoming traffic quite fastly. They adapt quite well. But but as a result, you you also take uh, the full hit of of any any attack done on your system, and you pay pay in full. So again, it's the same 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 uh, 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 same dilemma we discussed about wh whether you would pay more in order to to serve your traffic, or you'd prefer to limit yourself in order to to protect your uh, cloud budgets. So you can actually see that, that dilemma with two two different offering of the same database in AWS. And Michael, the limitation is written in AWS. Yeah, yeah, this is it, it's, in, it's, it's, in uh, small letters. In small letters in the configuring, yeah, but this is part of the the features of the database. Uh, yeah, uh, when and you need to consider them when choosing this specific mode. Well, th th this slide is exactly the same chart as, as the one I, I shown before. Just we we colored the the, uh, the different areas to emphasize where the damage is. 
So the purple is, is, uh, is which is obviously dominant. You can see the economic damage coming from the over provision database. Uh, and in the red, you can see the economic damage from serving the, the attack traffic, both the, the lambdas that were executed and, and in the database that, that uh, uh, received those uh, uh, rights coming from malicious traffic. And in the, those uh, relatively small orange areas, you can see the lambda functions that were actually executed before the database were able to scale up uh, and failed to, uh, uh, fail to write to the database. And you can see it as a small burst of, of, uh, uh, of performance damage. They're not uh, that dominant over the, the entire period of time, but probably in any production scenarios, you want to still want to see uh, 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 such peaks of failures. So uh, uh, the, the comparison here, I did it is similar to what Anat presented. It's like it's a flat DDoS scenario that's not breaching the upper capacity limit exactly like the uh, I did in the, the this experiment against the, the tandem uh, uh, attack with YoYo. And what we can see here, and, and that's probably the, the, the main point that with uh, far less resources, 70% less resources, an attacker can also knock out the system to create some performance damage. And, and also create economic damage both on the lambdas and both on the database. And it's very lucrative for the attackers because on that 70% uh, of available time, they do use the same infrastructure, same control planes to knock out other systems, other services. We've uh, uh, seen lately some, some articles referring to the fact that most of these attacks are actually coming from uh, uh, machines that were able to, to access within the cloud providers themselves, uh, which is also very interesting. And, uh, and again, the, the focus here is, is on the, the difference between the scale, relatively uh, slow scale down and scale up of the DynamoDB comparing to the Lambda, that uncorrelated scaling uh, mechanism is, the, is what allowed me to, to perform the damage. So a little bit off topic of Tandem and YoYo, but we want to present another type of attack that we know that uh, it's getting popular. Uh, we actually got some of the, the information from a, a company owned by uh, uh, IBM in Israel. Um, and and that, the, that company, what we learned from them is that in many cases, when companies refer to as application DDoS, cloud DDoS, even YoYo sometimes, they actually, what they mean, they they, they suffered from a, 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 what we call a leech attack. And, and in this attack, the attacker adds traffic, but in a very slow uh, pacing manner. Uh, with a single goal of causing financial financial damage over time. It's usually employed on, on comp competing companies that you want to knock out uh, uh, or, or empty their cloud budgets. And the, the tricky element here is that you have zero performance damage over time, which means no one from the DevOps team uh, 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 will see anything. And the, the slow increase in the cost uh, uh, might be too low to, to alert anyone. And again, this is a synthetic example. Uh, but we know it happened in, in real life scenarios where, where companies suffered uh, tremendous losses over time from such an attacks. Yeah, this one's particularly nefarious, uh, extremely hard to detect. Um, there was there was one question actually uh, on the last slide, Michael, uh, point of clar uh, clarification. Did I hear correctly that the majority of attack volume comes from inside the cloud providers? So I think I encountered an article by Cloudflare probably, but today, you know, one of the popular attacks is, is stealing credentials or getting access to, to a, or getting root access to a, to a cloud account. And that, if, if you got such a, into to such a scenario as an attacker, you have an ability to provision resources as much as you want until uh, you'll hit either the, the, the technical limitation that, um, that those sysadmins uh, uh, implemented. And again, if, if you have the root access, you can also override that probably. And then you can provision resources and launch an attacks. So I know one, one popular way uh, usage of those machines is to actually to mine Bitcoin. The other one is to, to, to perform uh, uh, DDoS attacks. And, and from the attacker's perspective, you see getting in a, uh, in a pretty, uh, uh, a lucrative location over the internet. You have great uh, network uh, connectivity, and you can launch an attack from many places. Those addresses look legitimate. They're coming from within AWS, Azure, GCP. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's something that's probably out there. And again, companies usually don't share this data, so we can only quote it from uh, from uh, uh, research uh, companies. 
but that's something we know it's uh, it's happening right now. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, uh, mitigation. I'll start from from relatively naive mitigations that probably can anyone implement to a certain extent, and then then I'll dive more into to more uh, uh, complex tactics and and where our research will focus next. So the first one is rate limiting, uh, being a good neighbor between between two services. And what it says basically is to, to limit the traffic as close as possible to the origin. Uh, with rate limiting, you need to understand again, where the main entry points to your system and limit them according to the bottlenecks along the way. Again, in a very complex uh, production system that might be a bit tricky, but a lot of systems are, are, are relatively uh, uh, flat and you can, you can easily, by, by looking at the architecture, uh, uh, understand what, what you need to do. Now, in our case, limiting the Lambda to match the DB scaling uh, um, or the DB max capacity would at least uh, prevent some of the of the damage, and that's something that's relatively easy to implement. Um, you can use services that scale quickly. I know it's a very generic uh, and broad statement, but but if you let's say use Lambda and use uh, uh, I think someone mentioned RDS uh, uh, along the way. Um, so also RDS has a few modes of operation. The, the last one, the, the serverless one, uh, uh, is is quite adaptive to to shifting workloads. So you need to, to plan your stack to work with, with multiple services that scale uh, can scale together. Um, <clears throat> and, and the last one, maybe more a bit more interesting, is, is uh, uh, decoying the attacker by inserting noise to the response time when, when you think you're under an attack. Um, so as we, as we assume, the attackers don't have a lot, a lot of knowledge in their hand. They have uh, round trip time, and they have a, a, a successful and fail ratio. So if you insert some when you on again when you're under an attack, some random noise, random latency into the response time, um, you might be able to exhaust the attacker. And again, since they're using the same infrastructure to attack multiple targets at once with those bursts, uh, you it, it might be it might exhaust his algorithm, his control plane for the attack, and will make him go and search for a different uh, a target. Uh, the penalty anyway, if you're under an attack, I think is relatively low. To, to the gain you can uh, uh, you can uh, you can benefit and and some other uh, possible mitigation so retry is is a possibility but it does come with costs uh, in our research we showed that if the the power of attack is is high relatively to the to the traffic you're serving the the retry can actually uh, uh, spread the attack over a long period of time so instead of a relatively short burst you'll get a, a longer burst uh, that's still knocking out your system for longer periods in time, working for the, the uh, uh, to the benefit of the attacker. Uh, uh, in, and in any case, it it, it does uh, uh, pose significant increase in latency. And again, with system several systems like Lambda, exponential retry or back off strategy means exponential increase in cost, which is something we usually want to prevent. Um, but it can compensate when services are not sync. To, to a certain uh, to a certain extent, um, developing better control uh, planes that can back pressure. That's I think especially relevant for for cloud services. So I've seen I've seen some implementation over the internet of, of people that were aware they have similar simple uh, stacks like Lambda and, and DynamoDB, and they they glued some code together usually with uh, step functions or with other Lambda functions that were aware of the the stress level of one of the services and adjusted the other services accordingly. Um, so if if I would be a cloud provider, I would try to offer it as part of my offering to allow some, some level of synchronization between between the services. And they can achieve that since they have same same metric control plane in AWS, it's CloudWatch, and the others, I'm, I'm sure there's something similar. And, and the last one, that's what also I'm not referred to, is to it's important to validate the, the incoming traffic when possible. Uh, I know there are no no like hundred percent solutions for scrubbing application traffic, but it uh, 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 at any case it's something that it's it's better to implement, even when considering the the time penalty and the cost penalty it introduces. So conclusions. I'll go. Yeah. Before you head to the conclusion slide, Michael, a couple things. Um, I, you may have answered the first one, which was. Um, it just it feels natural for cloud providers themselves to find a way to avoid tandem attacks by providing coordination between the the scaling mechanisms of their microservices. Have you and that was something you just suggested right towards the end there? But have you seen any examples of of 
cloud providers actually addressing this at, uh, attack vector? Uh, I, I think not, uh, not yet. So you can see sometimes recommendations in blogs, but all the implementations I've seen so far were people that are implementing such minimized control plane by themselves, but it usually would have, would have been done over a few, uh, a few services. So I think that's something uh, uh, that probably be introduced by cloud services because the, the problem is out there. And, and you can see, I think AWS just introduced a few months ago some, some uh, a service that allows you to like blueprint your entire architecture. So I would try to fit those, uh, those uh, features right into that area. Um, because again, you need, you need sometimes visibility as a system administrator. You need to take a decision where it is, it is the proper case or not. Uh, but it should be it should be like a, a one click operation. But, but Michael, I think that it's difficult. But because in random attack, you need also to understand the application level, and the cloud provider doesn't know the application level. So yeah, th that's 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 a uh, uh, hundred percent true. One of the the tricky things here, let's even if we take our our, our example, that the DynamoDB has no no prior knowledge that it's being uh, uh, getting a, a incoming request from from the lambda. So there'll probably have to be some level of declaration in, uh, by, by the system administrator, but following that declaration, th this is the architecture. And again, there are services that are going this way right now. Uh, um, th there should be some mechanism that allows you to, to control the, the synchronization between them. So I can see a few hacky ways to implement it, but, but I think we'll stop at this point. Yeah, so there's there's a handful of more questions here just with the last 10 or 12 minutes that we've got um, with this audience. <clears throat> the first question is, sorry? No, no, go ahead, sure. Okay, yeah, the first question is, um, how does the extent that the underlying services are controlled by third parties impact mitigation efforts as that limits the ability to configure the services to play nicely together? Uh, I think it's a, it is a huge problem. At any point that some some uh, uh, management was taken away from you as a system administrator, uh, you might might encounter uh, uh, a problem implementing a solution. So even if you, even if you get the matrix through some uh, I know Datadog or some central system to, that will provide you a third party uh, managed system matrix, it doesn't mean you can uh, uh, you can actively uh, 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 configure it. Um, so again, uh, like a unified control control plane is something that's not out there today. So it's mostly about awareness and 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 knowing what you're doing when you're designing a system. Yeah, but that's yeah, that's a huge pain point. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a question or a statement from Sid. He's saying uh, is saying um, application traffic may be able to be off to using something like Spire which is a way to give identities to workloads potentially. So that, that's, that's uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of this, uh, this methodology, but this is a, uh, uh, this could, could lead to, if, if there's an ability to, to tag or to give identity to a workload, then, uh, then yeah, it's, it's giving us more, more potential to, to, to scrub the, the bad traffic away. But when, at least when I'm, I'm approaching these problems, I assume that the attacker was able to hack, a, hack an identity, is posing as a legitimate user, as in all the, 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 uh, um, the, the walls we were able to put along the way were breached. And now we, st we still need to, to somehow adapt the system to the, to the workload of the attacker while serving the benign traffic. Um, but yeah, if, if you are able to scrub away traffic, that's something that's probably the best solution in order to uh, uh, to limit uh, uh, your system. Do we have any more questions from the chat, Jeremy? Not that I found. Yeah, are, are you uh, you want to wrap up them the last few minutes or questions? I'll if any more show up, I'll I'll let you know. Right. So again, I'm, I'm not gonna go over it uh, in too many, too many details. The, the trade-off is again, between cost and performance, the, the over-provisioning and reserve pools can compensate for DDoS up to a certain extent, but with significant extra cost. Um, 
in large systems, the microservice connectivity and the dependency can become quite complex and hard to analyze that, that I'll talk about in the next slide of our future work. And definitely serverless is not a, a solution for tandem attack. The same 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 issue, same vulnerability applies to serverless and non-serverless uh, uh, systems. And if talking about a bit the, the, the future work or the, the researchers we just started to, to uh, focus on, so we're looking at two two main areas in order to solve the, the grand problem. One is detection or observability in a more uh, uh, nicer way, is to collect real-time data from system with complex microservices dependency. We're looking a bit about into eBPF as a potential way to, to gather key matrix. And as you mentioned before, the problem is not necessarily on the CPU or memory classical uh, uh, approaches to auto scale. It could be storage, network bottlenecks, and, and many other aspects that that can be fair, need to be to be collected. Identifying these matrices is a, is a huge challenge uh, per each service, and and gaining some insights from them. Uh, the second part is 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 developing the algorithm that can analyze such such real time data quite quickly and decide on the mitigation, either by implementing back pressure, seeing scaling between services, and, and again, we're, we're pretty far from, from uh, 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 a, a solution offering there. Uh, so that's the, the continuation of what we have done in the, the probably the reason to, uh, from now we're transitioning from defining the problem to trying to, to solve it on the, on the academic uh, level. Um, so if you want to read more information about our research and see other related research, most of them, I think, are in the Deepness Lab. That's the research group Anat is leading. And this is Anat's email, my email. Uh, so feel free to, to send an email, add us on LinkedIn, and, and we'll be happy to follow up and hear some of the, the your ideas or questions. Uh, so that, I think, is everything from my side. Okay, that was a lot. That was a lot. Um, hopefully, the audience, uh, you know, took something away from that. I know I did. Um, there is there is one remaining question here. I think it was related to the future work slide, which suggested EBPF may play a role. Um, the question is, could Istio help with EBPF data collection? Um, possibly. I'll be if anyone wanna uh, wanna collaborate, brainstorm on how to properly do it. I'll be more than happy to. Uh, so we're getting a lot of data on how to to implement. I'm not finished the uh, 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 sabbatical. I tried that most uh, also on on this topic, and we're looking for uh, uh, people that uh, might might uh, also be benefiting, but also might contribute to to this research. Okay. Um, any closing thoughts from you, Anat or Michael, while we're just at about oh about five minutes left or so? Again, thank you for inviting us. Uh, we like to hear more feedbacks. Uh, Michael, show our emails. Um, about EPPF, there is a Pixia, which is a, in this uh, CNCF foundation. It's open source. Uh, but all this infrastructure collected uh, metrics, but there's no, we're not aware of a brain that can detect and mitigate yo yo or tandem attack. Michael? Oh, thank you for having us. It was fun, and yeah. really be happy to to follow up with uh, with any one of you. Great, great questions along the way too. And for those who are able to respond to the polls, that's also really helpful in guiding the conversation here and helping give us all some context. So thank you for that, and thank you for spending your time with us, Jen. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Anat, Michael, and Jeremy. This was fantastic, and the use of the polls was an awesome way to spur dialogue. So. Um, very exciting topic. And um, from here, what will happen is we will um, get the recording and cut it down and um, publish it so folks can access the video recording. If you register for the event, which you're on here, you registered, you will get an email from us with a link to that once it's live. It'll either be toward the end of this week or early next week. Um, and then I just want to let everybody know that um, our next Research Days talk will be on April 19th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
Um, and this will be on open source developments towards fluid network control and data plans. This is an overview of looking back in time 10 years and looking forward 10 years. And the conversation, the speaker is Christian Rotenberg from um, Unicampus, which is um, University of Cabinas in Brazil, and um, Simone Fairland Ryder, who's a, a, a senior software engineer at Red Hat. So that'll also be included in the follow up email. So, again, thank you so much to our speakers and conversation leader today um, for a really engaging talk. We really love these, running these, and um, the dialogue they spur. So, um, have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.